Let me introduce myself. That's yes. kind of nice. <laughs> I'm Greg Moselle. I am a follower of Jesus. Sometimes that goes well, and sometimes I struggle, and I'm grateful for God's grace. Amen. <laughs> Father, we ask you to speak to us now. May, may I increase, may your word, may your spirit increase. Would you teach us and show us and shape us more into the character of Jesus? God, for people who are hurting today, and that's probably most of us for different reasons, the hope of the resurrection and that Jesus, you are with us along the way. Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Sometimes life is filled with <clears throat> some of the most profound questions. It might be when we're standing at the grave of a family member, a friend, someone we love. And we ask God, why? Th th this person's such a blessing. and should have had so many more years to live. God, why? Sometimes it might be as we spiral with anxiety or depression or stress. And it seems like the vortex just, just keeps spinning. And we're like, God, how, how, how much is it? This doesn't seem like the abundant life that I sometimes read about. Maybe it's when we look at our news feed or maybe from people for, from different nations, it's, it's family and friends back home when they're suffering in the world. Rather it's war or it's famine or disease or abuse. Sometimes it's the temptations that we experience and, and, and we feel like kind of like the vinyl record. You've heard of vinyl records, right? Okay. Vinyl records where there's a scratch in it and it just keeps, it just keeps coming, coming. And it's like this temptation, God, it just keeps coming back around. All of us have different questions, don't we? Where there's mystery and, and there might be suffering. <clears throat> so we're in a signs of hope series and we've come to, to, to the seventh sign. And this seventh sign <clears throat> is an episode that addresses some of the most profound questions we could ever ask, but in the midst of it speaks hope beyond what we could have ever fathomed. Uh, and so th this is found in John chapter 11. So if you would turn in your Bibles or uh, on your device, uh, or if not, feel free to just look uh, at the person next to you or those of you who are at home grateful for uh, people worshiping in, in the house here and, and also people in their homes. Uh, if we could turn to John chapter 11, where we read the seventh sign. Now, the Gospel of John has these seven signs. Uh, for John, miracles aren't just powerful acts of Jesus. They're those, but they're much more. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are often called the synoptic Gospels, <clears throat> their miracles are in the Greek dunamis, dynamite they're powerful acts of jesus okay but john chooses the word samea which is a word for sign so there's still powerful miracles of jesus but john out of all that jesus does there's seven of these that specifically say this was a sign and out of these seven john is building for us a portrait kind of a growing portrait kind of a growing plot line of a portrait of who jesus is and why Jesus has come into the world. And this is the crescendo about resurrection. Now let's understand the context because Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He knows what's ahead. He knows the mission that the Father has given to him. And so he's heading toward Jerusalem. Now Bethany is only two miles out of Jerusalem. So he's come within two, this is kind of like the last stop before he goes into Jerusalem. And so the first 11 chapters of John are where these seven signs are. And now we've come to, to the place after chapter 11. Chapter 12 is the entry into Jerusalem, Palm, Palm Sunday, and the rest is in Jerusalem. In other words, here's these seven signs, and then Jesus' next chapter is gonna go into Jerusalem, and he is gonna fulfill those signs in action in Jerusalem. And so he's heading to Jerusalem, two miles away, and, and this is how concerned his friends are about what's about to happen. Uh, look at verse 8, and we're going to pick up the narrative mainly in verse 17, but just look at John uh, verse 11, or I'm sorry, chapter 11, verse 8. <clears throat> and Jesus says, hey, let's go back to Judea. Judea is the region in which Jerusalem is, okay? And his disciples say, well, wait a minute, Jesus, hold on. You know, Rabbi, a short while back, the Pharisees there, 
<clears throat> tried to stone you, and yet you're going back. In other words, they know this is dangerous. Let's just, let's just stay on this side of the Jordan River. It's a lot safer here. But Jesus knows where he's going and what his mission is. And this seventh sign, remember in the Gospel of John, the number seven, matter of fact, in the Hebrew mind, the number seven was a sign of something perfect or complete. Six is a parody of that. It's a fake of that. But seven, like in the Gospel of John, there's these seven signs. There's seven times Jesus says, I am, right? And then if you read a revelation, there's sevens of all kinds of things there. And that's just a literary way to say, this is the complete, this is the perfect. In other words, the completion, the perfect of what Jesus came to do, seventh sign is going to reveal, and that's ultimately victory over death, resurrection. And that in this life, Jesus can bring life out of what seems to be dead in this life within us. And so now we move <clears throat> to John chapter 11, verse 17. Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish friends had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brothers. So uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are friends of Jesus. He had had dinner at their house. He'd spent time with them. They're good friends. And now Lazarus has died. And by the time Jesus shows up, we read that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. If you notice throughout the Gospel of John, every Gospel, but especially John, John documents numbers, locations. I mean, he really documents carefully. And John is really documenting here, Lazarus is dead. Make no mistake. It isn't like, oh, he was just sick and Jesus came and, well, hey, he's, he's for four days, he's been dead. Matter of fact, in verse 39, before Jesus says, hey, um, open the tomb, right? What do they say to him? Wait a minute, Jesus. There's a bad odor, for he's been dead for four days. John is making the point. This guy is deader than dead, okay? But I want to give a little excursus here, because this passage also speaks about community and about how Jesus, on this side of our resurrection, is with us, even through the challenges of life. Did you notice the community surrounding Mary and Martha. A number of their friends had hiked two miles out of Jerusalem to come visit them. Now, they didn't call an Uber. They didn't drive. They didn't take a bus. They hiked. Uh, we've been in what, it, what is today the remnants of, of Bethany. And remember, Jerusalem is on kind of a mountaintop, right? right? It's, matter of fact, the Psalms of Ascent were, were sung while ascending up to Jerusalem. Okay, and so the road from Jerusalem to Bethany is this winding, hilly path. They hiked that for two days. Remember, this is an agrarian culture. So most of the people, they have no vacation days accrued. They have no bereavement policy where they can take time off. This is what it means. They're sacrificing. They're sacrificing time at work, whatever their vocation was, whether they were baking bread or they were fishing or they were farming or they were in you know, commercial transactions, they're losing income and they're taking a lot of time and they're traveling by foot a couple of miles to be with these two sisters who are hurting. Isn't that a beautiful portrait of community? And I just wanna remind us that you know, the church is designed, God's people are designed to be a people who, well, Romans 12 says, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. I pray that the ACCC church community will continue to be, and all of us who are brothers and sisters in Christ, will rejoice with each other when there's rejoicing, and we'll come alongside each other and care for each other, walk alongside each other when we're wounded, when we're hurting, when we're confused, when we're broken. <clears throat> so now... The questions begin, all right? In verse 20, when Martha heard Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I do know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Here, Martha, later Mary, are gonna ask the same question of Jesus. Hey, if you just been, Jesus, where were you? If you'd have been here, Lazarus would be alive. They ask the same question, and it's the question humanity has been asking throughout history. It's the question of where is God when I'm hurting? Why is there suffering in the world? And here's what's critically important here. Jesus doesn't condemn them. 
He didn't say, what's the matter with you? You're friends of mine. Well, why don't you believe? Wait a minute. Why don't you understand this whole thing about the Messiah? How can you be asking questions? How can you be wrestling? How can you? Jesus doesn't do that. He just comes alongside them. And as we're going to see, he weeps alongside them. See, I hope we know a couple of things. First of all, grieving and lamenting is not a sign of weakness. Actually, in in some ways, when we rejoice and when we grieve, we're being the most human we can be because we're created in the image of God, a God who also grieves and rejoices. We're being human. It's not a sign of weakness. And and it also means that, that we have freedom to wrestle with God, to ask difficult questions. And they're not doing like, well, God, I'm, they're leaning in saying, God, Jesus, I believe, we, but, but I, I don't get, why aren't you here? What's, what's happening? And so we have freedom to wrestle with God, to be real. To Matter of fact, I'll share this. When our kids were growing up, actually even now, when they come to us with like difficult things, I rejoice. I mean, sometimes we really don't want to hear it the most, especially when they were young and they're like not particularly thrilled with mom and dad but I'm grateful that they come rather than feeling that it's not safe because then we never know what's really going on. And then one day something happens and we're like, what happened? Well, it wasn't safe. And God wants it to be safe for us to be real with God. <clears throat> but notice how Mary and Martha grieve differently. Martha's like an activist. She's like, she wants to be around people. She wants to ask questions. She wants to do things. That's how she's uh, wrestling with her grief. Meanwhile, Mary, Mary seems to need space and she needs time and she needs to, to reflect. We all grieve differently. And I want, to, I'm in, I want to mention one thing about grief and lament before we move forward. Because these last few years, I mean, all of life is filled with different seasons where there's lament and grief and mourning and, and unanswered questions. But last few years especially, right? And I think one of the challenges as we've been coming out of the pandemic is a lot of us are out of calibration and it just seems like life is busier than ever. And we're just like going through life. And when that happens to us and there's like lament or grief and we don't address it, it like kind of chases us. And eventually it's kind of like a pressure cooker. It just explodes. So a lot of us haven't really taken time to slow down or there will be seasons of our lives where we'll be grieving or we'll be mourning or we'll be suffering. And, and I want to remind us that when that happens, grief does not happen in a nice tidy line, okay? If we graph it, you know, it isn't like, oh, here's day two and day five, and okay, grief's getting less, it's nice and tidy, and grief goes like this, okay? I mean, in time, there's healing, but there will be moments when we feel like I'm beginning to move into the new normal. I'm, I feel kind of strong, and then something will happen. It may be a song, it may be a location, it may be a memory, it may be a smell, I'll I'll give you an example. And all of a sudden it feels like we're back at day one. That's okay, that's human. It doesn't mean we're not healing, it's just grieving goes like this. And then the highs tend to get a little less high and the lows a little less low. I'll give you an example. Have have you been walking on, on the beach? And the waves come in, right? And then all of a sudden a sneaker wave comes, right? Right. So you're walking along and you know, here's the waves. And all of a sudden there's that big one, you know, everything gets wet, whatever. Sometimes there's sneaker waves with grief where you're going along and all of a sudden it's like, where did that come from? Just be ready for that. Just know that, that, that grief has its own kind of process and lean in and embrace that. I just share that with us. That that's not a lack of faith. It doesn't mean we're not strong. All right. As a matter of fact, I'll, I'll mention this. In, um, so a couple years ago, my dad passed away. And the first fall, so this is probably nine months later, I stepped out on our back deck. Okay, And it was when a couple neighbors had first started their uh, wood stoves or, 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 or their fireplaces. And I could smell that wood, the wood burning in, in the fall air. And it immediately took me back to Cougar Campground when I was a kid and I could see my dad. I could see him stoking up the Coleman stove and the fire. and I could see what he was wearing. And I said, that was a pleasant memory. But still, it's like, boom, all of a sudden I was, does that make sense? Things like that happen. And that's okay. That's just part of grief. So moving on. <clears throat> it's also fascinating because Jesus did not come in the timing that the sisters wanted. This is important for us to know. They had been anguishing in grief for four days, wondering, 
where's Jesus? Maybe we feel weary waiting. Where's God? How come God hasn't? I mean, this makes perfect sense to me. And sometimes that happens to us. But God is not finished. There is still going to come that Jesus is with them. He hasn't abandoned them. And there's going to be resurrection. God's power is going to be manifest in God's time. Um, in African-American churches, in, in the black church, and, and I, sometimes when I'm traveling um, or on vacation, I worship at black churches. I'm, I'm kind of a black guy trapped in a white guy's body in this sense. I really love African-American work, you know, kind of the rhythm, the cadence, the movement of it. Just, I resonate with that, the call response. Okay, and in the black church, many of my friends who, who are African-American Christ followers, there's a saying, and it's, God may not show up when I want, but he's always right on time. God may not show up when I want, but he's always right on time. And there's going to be times when we feel like we're waiting on God. We're like in the waiting room of God. And that doesn't necessarily mean a lack of faith. It's that God is sovereign and God sees and understands things that we can't see. And for Mary and Martha, there was an anguishing time, but Jesus was with them, and eventually God's power was manifest. So <clears throat> now let's look at um, how, how, how Jesus responds to this. Look, look down at verse 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha asked, oh, I know, he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And then Jesus said to her, well, I'm the resurrection of the life. Those who believe in me will live even though they die. And whoever believes in me will ultimately never die. Do you believe this? Jesus says, I am the resurrection and, and the life. This is one of the reasons I love Jesus and I'm a Jesus follower. Because Jesus is unique in human. He's the only person who could claim this. See, he's the only deity who's come in earth to say, I'm here with you, and I am the resurrection, and I am the life. Uh, most uh, religious figures would say, hey, you know, I, I can point you to resurrection. I can point you to the deity who can give you life. Jesus doesn't say that. He says, I'm resurrection. I'm life. What he's saying is I'm God in the flesh with you, and I'm the source of life, and I'm the one who can raise from the dead. And you know, all of these signs are like that. I mean, think about feeding of the 5,000, which is really the feeding of the probably 8, 12, 15,000, because it says men. There was also probably women and children there. And Jesus didn't just give people bread, but then Jesus says, hey, I am the bread of life. I am the sustenance of life. I am the source of life. Je Jesus didn't just guide people to the temple. Hey, let me tell, I'll even walk you through so you can see the temple, so you can worship God, and so you can have your sins forgiven. Jesus says, I'm the temple, right? Destroy it in three days. It'll, I'm the temple, meaning what he's saying is a temple, God's presence on earth, and come to this temple, Jesus, and that's where you'll find the sacrifice for the forgiveness of your sins. Jesus is not just the remedy for one guy's blindness, who he gives sight to one blind guy, one of the signs. But Jesus says, I am the light of the world. If you're spiritually blind, I'm the one who can give you light to guide you through life with God's truth. And Jesus doesn't just share a parable. Hey, let me tell you a parable about resurrection. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And he raises Lazarus before their eyes. That's unique in human history. Now, like the Greco-Roman gods occasionally came to earth. Usually, sorry about this, to rape women. Okay? But the God of the Bible is the only deity who's ever come to earth in person to reveal who God is and to actually sacrifice his life to rescue his people. That's why I love Jesus. And so then Jesus says, do you believe? Do you believe this? It's the only time in the Gospel of John Jesus says that to someone. Do you believe this. I want to mention one thing here, a little bit intricate, but we can unpack it simply. Remember in the Gospel of John, believe is the Greek word pistuo. Remember John wrote in the Greek language and we translate it. Pistuo doesn't just mean cognitive belief, it's part of it, but belief is like an act of trust, okay? But here Jesus says pistuo ace. Here's what that means. Pistuo, believe, ace means into. What he's really saying, will you believe into this? Not just will you stand there and cognitively, will you take a step? It's like, will you take a step and actually believe into this? Will you actually trust? Will you take a step of faith? 
and trust. And I think Jesus still says that to us today. Do you believe this? Not just cognitively, although that's a step. But will we believe into it? Will we take the step of faith to trust you? Matter of fact, what might there be in our lives right now that we're not really trusting Jesus with? It might be because we're ashamed of something, right? It might be because we're withholding something. It might be because we just don't want to give something up. And Jesus says, take, take the step, step into this to trust me with this. The one who is real life and who is ultimate resurrection. So now Mary finally meets with Jesus. Move, move down to verse 33. When Jesus saw Mary weeping and the Jewish friends who had come along with her weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? Jesus asked. Come and see, Lord. They replied, and then Jesus wept. These, these three verses to me, perhaps in all of, of Scripture, but it's one of the key places where we learn more about the heart of God in action. And it's because of three things. First of all, there's a couple of words. It says Jesus was moved. That's kind of a weak translation. I mean, I understand the NIV translators, one of whom I, I know fairly well, um, they know a lot more than I do. But I'll say this, moved is kind of a gentle word. It's trans so Jesus was moved by this. Uh, it's translated from the Greek word embromasha, which is a word, okay, the etymology, the portrait of how that's come was for a horse snorting. Have you ever been at a farm or at a fair and the horse goes, and you're like, ooh, man, the snot, right? It's like, okay. It's a word for the deepest anger in the Greek language. Then it says that Jesus was troubled. That's translated from the word terrasso. That means to stir something or it's a storm. So Jesus is, Jesus is angry as a snorting horse stirred like a tornado. Does that make sense? That's the portrait. I mean, John is overdoing it. Say, Jesus is really angry. He's anguished. He's deeply moved. Now, what's he so angry about? What is his issue? He's angry at death. He is facing human death. And he sees all the people there grieving, mourning, brokenhearted, and Jesus weeps. Now, let's, let's think about this. What did Jesus do with his anger? See, the next time that you're grieving something, remember this, Jesus weeps alongside us, but he's also angry about those things. Not toward us, but Jesus, Jesus is angry. He's like, that, that, there's been enough death. And there's been enough weeping and mourning and suffering and brokenness. I've had it. Ah, oh, it's like a storm. And what did he do about it? He went to the cross and he died. So that then, although we may experience human death, we'll have eternal life, not eternal death. Isn't that powerful? He was so angry with death, so angry with sin, so angry with human depravity, so angry with human brokenness, that he went to the cross and he gave his life so that we could be rescued. That's our Savior. That's Jesus. And did you notice in verse 36, the people said, see how Jesus loved him. Well, we on this side of the cross could really look and say, see how Jesus loves me. That he was so angry with death, so brokenhearted. He, he still weeps alongside us but he gave his life so we could be raised. See how Jesus loves you and me. We don't earn it. We don't achieve it. We don't deserve it. That's grace. So now when we move to verse 43, we see the real crescendo. This is where the sign is, is fully manifest. Verse 43, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. I'm glad Jesus didn't just say, come out of the tomb or everybody dead. What, what, okay. He's like, no, no, it's not time for that yet. There will come that day, but Lazarus, you, right? Come out. And the dead man came out of the tomb, hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his face. And Jesus said, take off the grave clothes 
and let him go. Here's the seventh sign, right? Seventh sign of completion, perfection, it's resurrection. That's the fullness, the completion, the, the perfection of Jesus' mission is that there will be life out of death. What that means is we may feel spiritually dead, emotionally dead, relationally dead, whatever. And Jesus says, I want you to experience life in this life. But that's just a foretaste. That's just like a sample. That's just like a movie trailer of what's coming when we will have true resurrection to a world that will have been recreated and all sin will have been banished. Sometimes people ask, this is a sidebar, but it's, um, we're almost done here. Sometimes people ask, you know, why, why someday will there have to be judgment? Here's why. Because if God allows evil to reside in eternity, it's just this world all over again. But Jesus says there's going to come a point where evil and depravity and injustice and violence and disease and disaster are all going to be moved out. And what will be left is perfection, the recreated perfection of God's beloved forgiven children clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Isn't that beautiful? Where we'll never fear again those things that have haunted humanity. But Jesus says something fascinating here. I, I haven't heard this in any sermon. I haven't read it in any resource. So here we go. All right. He says, take the grave clothes off. But it's fascinating. Here's what surprised me. The Greek word here for, for the cloth, you know, the grave clothes, the cloth, is a fascinating Greek word that John wrote. It's dedimenos. And it surprised me because it's a word for something that's chained. It's the word for something that is held in bondage. What he's saying is, listen, the guy is in bondage with all of these, uh, uh, with all this cloth, and you know what? He's alive. He shouldn't be in bondage. So release the guy so he can live. And I think Jesus says to you and me, take off the grave clothes. Take off the things that once bound us that once imprisoned us, that we were once in bondage. Should we have a new identity in Christ? Don't go back to those old things that once held us in bondage. And don't think somehow, don't let Satan whisper to us, hey, remember those things from the past that used to bind you? God, God doesn't love you. No, Jesus says, take those off. We're now set free to come out of the tomb and to live life to the fullest. Because remember, we're Lazarus. Remember, this is a sign. I mean, Lazarus was a real literal human, but it's a sign that everyone who's in, in the tomb, who's spiritually dead and lost and broken, Jesus says, come on out. I've given my life for you. You don't need to live in death. Come on out and take off. Allow the spirit in a lifetime to take off all the things that bind us up and set us free to be God's people. But let's remember the narrative, Jesus is heading to Jerusalem. And so look at verse 53 to wrap it up. Here are the religious leaders. And they say, hmm. So from that day, they plotted to take his life. This was the sign where they said, this is, the, the, Jesus is getting too popular. People are, are turning to him. We're losing our power base. We got to get rid of him. Matter of fact, they actually earlier said, hey, let's kill Lazarus. And I'm like, really? You're going to kill the guy who Jesus raised? All right, kill him and Jesus will raise him again. How, how? I mean, are you kidding me? They didn't doubt that this happened. What they said is, wow, Jesus is becoming really popular and we're losing our control. And there's times where we'll hold on to control of our life because Jesus might be calling us to things that'll be challenging. But here's what's fascinating. Jesus knew what was coming and he was faithful to his mission. You know, Jesus at this point could have said, wow, you know, the last two miles into Jerusalem, that's going to be pretty dangerous in there and all that the suffering and the torture and the flogging and the crucifixion. You know, God, I think I'm out. You know, I'm, I'm going to marry a nice Jewish girl and go to Capernaum and they have a nice synagogue there and I can have a good career preaching, right? To be honest, that's what a lot of Christians do. Always a temptation for us to say, thank you, Jesus, but this is as far as I'll go. I think I'll just settle for a little bit of spirituality. But Jesus, thank God, Jesus knew what was coming in Jerusalem. And he entered Jerusalem. 
and he gave his life to rescue you and me. So let's finish with Shakespeare, right? And I know some of you are like, great. Some of you are like, oh no. You have any like flashbacks? Like, man, I had to read that in high school and college, right? But Shakespeare in Hamlet, probably the most famous line of Shakespeare, right? To be or not to be, that's the question. So let me leave you with, I think, what John's drama leaves us with. Not to be or not to be, that's the question. To believe or not to believe, that's the question. So I hope when we roll over in bed tonight in the days to come, God's spirit of minds, to believe or not to believe, that's the question for my life. When I see these signs, when I see who Jesus really is, will I take the step to believe, to trust, to take a step of faith, to trust Jesus, to receive a new identity, to be loved by God the Father, to be forgiven by Jesus, to be guided by the Spirit, and to know that there is resurrection coming. And that's why John leaves us at the end in John chapter 20, the end of his gospel narrative says this, these signs are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I pray wherever we are, whatever that next step, we'll take that step to trust Jesus with our lives. Father, we're grateful for um, Jesus that you guided John, who must have labored and labored to write this, even though it was inspired by your spirit. It came also from his heart, his mind, and his experiences. And that he has written for us by your spirit, what helps us to really see who Jesus is. God, thank you that Jesus did enter into Jerusalem. We'll celebrate that next Sunday, Palm Sunday. And then we'll go through either Monday, Thursday, or Good Friday, the crucifixion. And then we'll celebrate the resurrection on Easter. Thank you that those just aren't liturgical things that we do. In real life, Jesus, you went into Jerusalem and you gave your life. You were so angry at our brokenness, at our depravity, at our loss, at our death, that you died in our place so we could have life. Hallelujah. Thanks be to you, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.